Oh, I feel, I feel loved. So we're going to look at a video of Bowery Farming. Irving Fain's going to join us in a moment. We're going to see how they make food on a roof in Brooklyn. Agriculture is at the epicenter of so many different global problems. We actually consume about 70% of our global water supply through agriculture today. And if you just look at the U.S. alone, we use about 700 million pounds of pesticides every single year. Separately there, you've got globally a population that's growing to between 9 and 10 billion people, according to the UN, by 2050. And to feed that growing population, we need somewhere between 50 to 70 percent more food. What really attracted us to the problem we're solving at Bowery is that while those changes are happening, 70 to 80 percent of the population is going to be living in and around cities in the next 35 years. So we became pretty obsessed with this question of how do you provide fresh food to urban environments in a way that's more efficient and more sustainable. We looked at this question of providing fresh food for urban environments in a way that's more efficient and more sustainable from the ground up, meaning we wanted to figure out what's the best technological approach to solve that problem. And ultimately, we have built both hardware and a proprietary software system from the ground up to build large-scale commercial indoor farms. And we are able, in this completely controlled environment, to grow vertically stacked. So we use LEDs to grow vertically so that we can use the cubic space of an indoor space much more efficiently. But we also grow 365 days of the year, totally independent of weather and seasonality, which uninterrupted and undisrupted reliable supply of quality food is a major change in agriculture just to start there. But we also grow with absolutely chemical-free food. So no pesticides, no herbicides, no fungicides, no insecticides. We sell ourselves to wholesale providers. So we sell to supermarkets, grocery stores, and to restaurants as well. And the end consumer is anyone going into those restaurants or purchasing the product you know, at a grocery store. So we think about our customers both from the standpoint of the retailers and food service providers that we sell to, but also the end consumer that's coming in and buying the product. So let's bring out Irving Fain. Come on out here. Welcome to the uh, to the hot zone. How's yes. everybody doing? Is it nice and hot in here? Yeah, beautiful. How many of you guys are entrepreneurs? So we understand who we're talking to. Like three. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's everybody else doing here? <laughs> we thought there was a ba basketball game. All right. So Irving, I want to tell a story real quick to to kind of set the scene. Uh, a couple months ago, I was at a conference and I had just closed a startup myself. And I was talking to somebody who knew me from the startup world, and he, he asked me what, how it was going. And I, I almost welled up in tears, because it was out of frustration and out of the sheer horror of my own failure. When's an experience, when have you had that experience? Have you had it yet? Would you like to have it? No, I, I think in, in some ways the difficulty of building a company is you have at least a miniaturized version of that experience on a regular basis. I mean, it is, a, it is an incredibly emotionally intensive experience all the time. And, okay. and what I say to people is, you can finish a day on the highest of highs and wake up the next morning and get a phone call or get an email overnight that starts you on that lowest of lows. Or you could finish a day in a terrible place and wake up the next morning to completely different news. I mean, it really truly is like every day is a different, is a different day. Is it, is it always an external thing that, that does it to you? And you in particular. How, and how do you cope with that kind of thing? I don't think it's always external. I think it's part of being an entrepreneur is sort of venturing into the unknown and getting comfortable in dealing with, to an extent, the fact that there are a number of important variables that you can't definitively know on a regular basis. And you have to try to learn and understand and validate those key variables as quickly as possible, but there's a period of time where they will remain unknown. And that unknown nature, I think, is for me and for any entrepreneur can be a scary idea and it be, can be a scary notion because you're looking down the pipe and saying, well, if these things that I think are true end up not being true or these things that I don't think are true end up being true, that's going to test the assumptions that I've made and potentially put me in a position where I've got to rethink a bunch of areas about what I'm building. Okay, so what you're basically saying is that in the, in the cubicle world, let's say, say we're working for a bank or whatever, you have these long periods of not doing that much. 
most of the time. I mean, you're not, maybe you're like writing an email here or there, going to a meeting, doing stuff. But <laughs> what you're saying is that you do things in series and the spaces in between those things are full of abject terror. Yeah, and, and you're doing, you're constantly doing things. You're constantly doing different things, but you have to recognize that no matter what you do, there is always, there's going to be a question mark hanging over some things. If you work at a bank, you know, you maybe you win a deal, maybe you mm -hmm. don't, but the bank is most likely going to be around yeah, next year. It's not going to fall over then, because yeah. you, didn't, you forgot your meeting. Yeah, it's one deal, you know, in, in, in the lifetime of a bank. If you're waiting for that major customer and that deal doesn't come through when you thought it was going to, that can be a crushing blow. I mean, that can really test your question, that can test your own conviction around, hey, does this really work? Do people really want my product? Okay. So your product is very specifically uh, kind of hippie, fancy food stuff, right? <laughs> not at all. Well, hold on. Let's, 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 I, got a, it's, I, got a, I got a point here. I'm not trying to insult you. I'm basically trying to ask, at what point did the ideal of what you're trying to build, the ideal uh, food that's close by, that's local, that's delivered daily, that's nice and fresh, and then uses no chemicals, at what point did the ideal bump up against the reality, and how did you deal with that? Yeah, so it's important that actually we are not building or producing food that's inaccessible to most people. Mm -hmm. Like our goal is to provide better access to high quality food to more people. And so part of the, the assessment that we used before diving into moving forward with Bowery was, can we actually do that? Because for us, it was important to understand and make sure we weren't just going to produce this inaccessible premium product okay. necessarily. So you can do, we spent a year and a half researching, doing as much work as we could, testing different growing methodologies, testing different technologies, but everything we were testing was at a relatively small scale. And I think an interesting moment for us was this time where we, where, where we stepped back and said, okay, the next step for us needs to be to build a full-scale commercial farm. Okay. We don't have a full-scale commercial farm now. We know what we're doing works in the smaller scale. We think it works in this commercial scale, but we don't actually know. And it was a very interesting period going from this, hey, we've got this small scale thing and a lot of really good ideas and mm -hmm. smart thinking to actually having a fully operational and built farm. When did you have to pitch to raise enough money to make the full-scale commercial? So we, we were sort of in a fortunate position because I'd been in technology for a long time and so I had been staying in touch with people as I was working on Bowery and as we were thinking about Bowery and so we had folks even early on who said, hey, we'd love to give you a little bit of seed money to just get started. And my point of view was, listen, I don't want to take money from people to essentially fund the science mm -hmm. experiment because there's a lot of questions in my own mind around, was this even going to work? And I didn't want to take money and then six months later come back and say, hey, so that thing we told you we were going to do, we're not doing, but I have this really good idea for an app, so trust me, this is going to be yeah. cool too. And so we held off on raising money for a while. So by the time we were actually ready to raise, we had a year, year and a half of work under our belt. We had people who'd been watching us over time, watching our progress, kind of understanding what we were doing. And so they'd already gotten a lot more comfortable with the process, where we were, and what we were trying to do. What would you recommend for somebody out here who's trying to raise money that might not be in your position? Yep. I mean, who do they, who do they talk to? So, how, do you, how do you even approach that person? I mean, I am a firm, firm believer that you want to start building relationships as early as possible with people who you're interested in raising money from. And, and in no way is that necessarily an easy thing, but trying to get in front of people, socialize your idea. Sometimes people are really worried about sharing their ideas because they're worried they're giving away something secretive or something in that idea. Giving someone a chance to pull coals and ask questions. What I usually say to people is, if you're not coming up with a dozen plus ways that you could be wrong or your idea couldn't mm -hmm. fail, you're not looking hard enough. Yep. And so you want that external feedback along the way, and it gives someone else a chance to get to know you, you get to know them, and ultimately they can watch you execute, and when the time comes when you're ready to raise money, they can look and say, hey, this is somebody I've gotten to know, I like what they're doing, I've seen them accomplish X, Y, and Z, I've seen them fail on a couple of other things, but see how they've responded to that failure, I'm comfortable backing this person. Okay. Is there a point in, in time when you thought that, yeah, you're going to have to tell all your investors that you're going to quit and build an app? <laughs> 
there wasn't a point in time where we thought we were going to have to quit and build an app, but it was definitely an, an interesting and at moments nerve-wracking time when we were building our farm, because here we are in this massive empty warehouse, and we know there's going to be a farm, mm -hmm. and I'd never embarked on a construction project of this scale. <laughs> and, you know, we have all these people, oh, this is the timeline, this is how it's going to look. You know, we had a very you know, extensive project plan built out, but you're still staring at an empty warehouse at yeah. the end of the day, and, and you know that that is going to become a farm. And telling all of our investors and telling the people around the table, hey, don't worry, here's a picture of a construction equipment inside of a building, but there'll be a farm here in a few months, saying it and then believing it and seeing it happen was sort of two different things. So you got, you're actually fairly lucky because you've already done this before. Yep. You had the opportunity. So for you, something like a long-term building project could actually be managed. You could actually handle that and your, and your people wouldn't freak out, right? I think w I was fortunate because it was a combination of the excitement and enthusiasm that people had for what we were building mm -hmm. and just the, the size of the idea, but also the fact that because I'd known people for a while and I'd known a lot of our investors and they'd sort of seen me build something before, they were a bit more comfortable to say, okay, you don't have this big farm, but I trust and believe that you will ultimately have it. But I, I trusted and believed it as well, but yeah. I didn't have it or know it was there. So there's still, again, going back to that uncertainty, you have to get comfortable living with a level of uncertainty as a founder. Okay, tell me about the worst pitch you've ever had as a founder. Uh, like me, I want to beat up VCs, just in general. But not know, in a most Christian and loving sense. I think the funny thing is there's some investors who completely understand what you're doing right out of the gate and get it, and then you can see those moments where somebody comes in and they don't understand at all what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I remember in my last company, like very early on, pitching to an angel investor sitting in a Le Pan here, like it was on like 56th Street, and trying to explain to him what we were building, and him just looking at us with a complete <laughs> blank stare. We were like 10 minutes into it, and I'm like, shit, we got an hour of a yep. coffee with this guy. I don't know how I'm going to take up an hour. And he just kept asking me, oh, is it like this? And you're like, no, no, no that's not at all what I'm talking about. Oh, so do you mean that? You're like, no, 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 not at all. And you just realize, I think I was younger then, and it was frustrating to me that someone didn't get it. I think now I've gotten to the point to say, there is no such thing as a deal that's for everybody. Mm -hmm. No deal is, is interesting and exciting for every single venture capitalist. Like some deals are exciting to these people and other deals aren't exciting to them and vice versa. What happens if the deal's for nobody? What, if, what happens if nobody picks it up? Uh, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm an optimist. I probably am. Yeah. I'm an entrepreneur. I think that there's always an opportunity to raise capital if you're persevere. If you have the perseverance and you try and you kind of, it may not be your optimal idea. You may cobble together an angel round from a lot of people, but you can get there. Uh, I think at some point, if you literally just can't get there, or you move down the stack so much further, taking a step back and saying, maybe it's not you necessarily. What is wrong with what you're pitching? What's the consistency and feedback you're getting? What are people telling you? Where are the common themes? And maybe there's something happening here that you haven't thought about. Maybe there's an angle that's more problematic than you expected. How can you take that back to the drawing board and come back with something different? Okay. I, I wouldn't give up, though. Yeah. What, would, what advice would you give yourself uh, now that you've done this a lot? Somebody brand new, starting out. Everything takes longer than you think. Yeah. I say it to my team all the time. I forget it myself. It's amazing. And, and I think everything always is going to take longer than you think. It's a, I'd say three things. That, manage expectations. Uh, it's really important to manage expectations of the people around you, your investors, uh, so they understand what to expect from what you guys are doing. It can be easy to get so excited about your own business that you can almost talk too far ahead of yourself on the company. So managing expectations and just the like focus okay you know, it, I, I think being ready for the unprepared like no matter how much you prepare shit is going to happen that you weren't expecting and it's going to mess you up and speaking of that somebody asked me to ask this question of all the founders if you and a three-toed sloth were to get into a fight who would win and let's talk about a sloth that can actually move like faster than a sloth so is it a three-toed fast sloth, fast sloth or yeah, just like a three-toed sloth the claws. i think i actually i don't even think I would definitely win, assuming the sloth didn't take to the trees. Okay. If the sloth <laughs> took to the trees, I probably can't climb a tree the way I used to when I was a okay. kid. And so that well, you may could, give you him could a, still probably hit a tree. You could probably get up there if the adrenaline I could, was going. I could take the tree down, bring the sloth back down to the ground, and, then and just... probably retake him on the ground right, again. I think that's good. my expectation. All right, perfect. That's, that's all we needed to know. Fantastic. Irving, thank you. Hey, John, thanks Appreciate so much. Appreciate it.